Hi, Sudira. Hello. Hi, everyone. Nice to connect with uh, the team at uh, Spark Labs and, uh, and the team at uh, Taiwan. So I'm really excited uh, to present to you today. Uh, let me quickly share my screen um, to give you a quick intro before I do that and uh, share some slides for the next five minutes. I'm Sudhira. I've been at Google for close to seven years now, everything in Google Cloud and AI. Um, I was one of the first product leaders uh, joining Google Cloud, starting the Vertex AI platform, and that's given me the opportunity to build out the product roadmap for NLP, translation, and a lot of products at Google. Um, with that, um, let me quickly dive into my presentation for today. Uh, so I'm going to share some of my thoughts on generative AI and uh, the world of opportunities that it presents. Um, so here's a quick narrative of uh, what I'm seeing in the market. So generative AI is AI solutions that are capable of creating text, videos, sounds, images. These, what we call uh, these are modalities. So across all of these modalities, AI that can create text and uh, images and video and sounds based on the data that it is trained down. Um, and now we're seeing a huge transformation in the way uh, these models are, transform are kind of creating uh, various products within the industry. These Gen AI solutions are typically based on large language models. And I'll give you an example of a few of these as we go along. So here is um, a video, uh, almost a multimodal video of a cat playing a guitar uh, in France. And that was my prompt to one of the products called Runway ML. Um, all I had to do was say, give me an image of a cat playing a guitar in France. And this took me 30 seconds. Uh, I got the image and then uh, all I had to do was like wag the tail. Uh, I want the cat to strum the guitar here uh, and it should move from point A to point B and that's it. Uh, this took me 30 seconds, but without generative AI, this would have taken me at least um, uh, at least a couple of uh, hours or days to, to create this uh, image. So that's what I'm speaking in terms of the power of generative AI and the transformation that we are seeing across multiple applications. So in the past decade, um, so the first decade of my career has been in BGC and the second decade has been in SaaS and AI. And in the last uh, uh, decade, we have worked on plenty of supervised machine learning models where we used to get label data from customers, train models uh, for months and then deploy models. And this could take at least half a year. But now with prompting, this is becoming much faster. So these generative AI applications um, are related to the AI applications that we've seen in the past. So AI has been around for quite some time now. And I'll give you some examples of AI products that you may not think are actually AI products. 80% uh, of enterprise data is still very unstructured. Uh, so this is human generated emails, comms, PDFs, and one product from uh, Google called Doc AI turns unstructured data into structured data. And we see a lot of businesses are sitting on document gold mines, right? And these documents are going to grow with time. So that's an example of, you know, what some AI products built on supervised machine learning models did in the past, um, like cloud natural language. So what this does is if you have all of these documents, you can convert that into structured data. If you have, um, if you have some uh, customer reviews, you could detect the sentiment of those customer reviews using AI models for natural language. So all of this has existed in the past. Translation, all of you may be familiar with Google Cloud Translation that used to uh, essentially translate thousands of languages from one to another, and that's been around for almost a decade. All of these are supervised machine learning models but um, that have been around for the last decade, but now prompting is revolutionizing app AI application development in this decade. What used to take months is now taking minutes and hours and days to build. And that's where a fantastic opportunity exists for developers across the world. Here's an example of a generative AI application that I'm working on today. Um, Gemini Codesys is an AI powered collaborator where developers can essentially generate code, they can write tests, they can essentially transform their code repositories using generative AI. And a large percentage of code repositories and code that 
is being generated today. And uh, AI is almost a, a coding assistant for developers across Google, as well as a lot of other companies that we are selling uh, this product into. So this is how I see the industry landscape. Um, at the bottom layer, we have the hardware where there is Cerebris uh, Intel AMD. In the middle layer, you have infra and foundation models like dev tools. Um, and in the top layer, this application layer or blue layer is where there is a ton of opportunity for a lot of vertical AI startups and killers. There will be in the next few years, a tax AI winner or a, a, a planning a mortgage AI winner or a financial uh, AI winner, uh, healthcare. So there will be individual workflows where we will see if there is a lot of training data, great applications can be gen generated. And these applications can range from content creation to drug discovery, to data entry, to test and bug fixing. Um, the future is uh, looking very, very promising. So I will end with this slide. Here's a framework to look at the Gen AI investment landscape. Uh, the first quadrant is where we saw a lot of applications in the past for traditional AI. Uh, and the bottom quadrant is where we think there is a lot of uh, innovation happening where there can be a ton of investment. I will deep dive into this in the panel going forward, but uh, I wanted to leave you with that thought. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sudira. So let me introduce the second speakers, Louis Chen, the Chief Strategy Officer and Executive Vice President of Perfect Hope, a New York Stock Exchange listed company. Let's welcome Louis. Hello everyone, I'm Luis um, from Perfect Corp. It's a company born and raised in Taiwan. So we are a Taiwanese company, just happen to be listed overseas. Um, you know, we are nine years old, uh, working a lot in technology, specifically in AI. Uh, I think we were one of the very more fortunate companies that went global since day one, because we knew that the market uh, is really much bigger outside there. So today, about 99%, if no more, of our revenue contribution are coming from overseas market, especially, uh, especially from US and, and Europe, because we really play in the vertical for beauty and fashion. So as you may know, uh, France and US and Italy, they are typically uh, you know, a big market for that. But for the topic today, I really want to share with you some of these experiences, what we have been doing in AI, which is the theme of today. Uh, although AI is certainly the buzzword, is in the spotlight, uh, everybody talk about it, it didn't start just now, right? So if we look at our history, we infused AI in beauty tech since day one in 2015. Uh, if you don't recall 2015, 2016, that was the year that uh, DeepMind AlphaGo came out, right? And it shocked the world. And really it also struck me about, okay, if AI is going to be such a powerful tool, how can we use that to help our, our clients? So back in 2015, there was a challenge about the virtual try-on and consumer women buying beauty products. So we challenged ourselves and challenged our engineer, uh, what can AI help? And we were the one of the very first pioneer to use machine learning technology back then into AR, right? Combining AR and AI to give us a great precision in terms of the accuracy of the tracking, so they make up the rendering effects really good. Over the last decade, every year or two, there's a new evolution in AI techniques, in different tools, different models. And we keep adopting that, right? So we upgraded that with you know, deep learning and we've gained technology. And more recently in the last two years, I think the generative AI is really unlocking a lot of those potentials. So over this journey, we created so many different AI solutions for different verticals, specifically for skincare, beauty, and makeup or so. So um, you know, it's getting a little bit confusing for users. So we really saw an, the opportunity when AOM model is becoming so good. To tie this all together, we call it the beauty for AI strategy. So link the perfect AI solution that we created for brands uh, with natural conversational beauty AI assistant type. So uh, let me show you a short video about you know, how this works. Introducing Skincare GPT, your personal AI skincare assistant to help you get better skin. Simply ask any skincare related question and Skincare GPT will provide a human-like answer tailored to your needs. Let's give it a try. You can ask any question that you want, but you can also choose a frequently asked question. And that's what I'm going to do now. I will choose the first one. Recommend a skincare routine for my skin type. Okay, so first we need to take a selfie to start the analysis. Make sure that you have good lighting and a good face position. According to the analysis, my skin type is combination. Below that, I can already see a short skincare recommendation. If I tap on my photo, I can see highlighted in different colors my skin concerns. 
all very clear. And if we go back, we can already see some product recommendations and even tap buy now and add them to the cart. If we scroll further down, we can view the full skin analysis report. And if we do that, we can see on the right side there I have my image and all the different skin concerns highlighted in different colors. And then on the left side, we can see the full skin report and if we scroll down, we can see the details for each skin concern. So this is one of the examples of how we're able to take you know, conversational AIs and link that uh, you know, to help consumers understand their skin status, you know, what they need for their skin and for makeup. And our vision is that there will be more and more of these applications tailor-made for different use cases, right? So beauty is a very, very personalized category. So I think everybody's looking for something that they're really suitable for you. So here in the chart, you see, for example, in our roadmap, how we are taking skincare and even fashion and hair and put it all together. Uh, so that's what we call the framework. Um, not only that, I mean, I want to show you a few other things that uh, what AI can do. And amazingly, I mean, changing hairstyle is, is really, really difficult. It's a commitment, right? So before you actually go and do that, I think generally AI give us, you know, example. I can actually, you know, use my photo there and visualize myself in different haircuts and different styles before you go into a salon and do that, uh, take a commitment. Uh, so which actually I did. So uh, I always try to see myself in a, in a long hair. I never had the courage to do that. And I think the AI is really helping me. So this is just my regular photo selfie. And now I can see myself. Uh, yeah, I haven't show, see, show my wife that. Um, no more than that. What's the next step? Right? Fashion, I think, is really big. You know, we all agree that shopping for apparel is something a painful process. And this is something that we'd be able to do with our AI models to, to keep my identity, right? Keep my body posture. I know this is a photo I took at the top, top of the Eiffel Tower. And, and then, you know, you, with a single image, you know, that you can find on, on, on Shein, on Amazon, on Timu, I'll be able to do that and render myself. And, you know, I think that looks better than that like, model. I can actually know if that fit my styles. Right, and then lastly, you know, why I would wear that? You know, I would use the AI and then imagine I'm myself traveling to Safari or other places. So you can reproduce really epic li real life scene and it's getting so good. Right? Sometimes it's scary about that. We can talk about that in the panel later. But again, this is just a short intro about what we do. Um, thanks, thank you. Thank you, Luis. So now let's get into today's uh, fireside chat session. So today's we are very honored to have a, a very seasoned technology colonist to moderate the fireside chat session for us. So today's we are going to have a team component, a seasoned tech, a res, a co correspondent uh, in, in Asia. So let's welcome Sudira, Luis and team to deliver the fireside chat session for us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Tim Culpin. Uh, it's very nice to see a lot of familiar faces out here today. I think I've seen here at Spark Labs before. Um, many of you know me. I've been in Taiwan 25 years. Up until uh, two days ago, I was working for a large international media organization, but uh, I quit two days ago, and this is my first public event. Uh, so uh, I'd only turn up for Edgar, so uh, Edgar's the guy who got me here. Um, and of course, AI is the, the theme of the day. Um, I might be the only person in this room who's not going into AI, uh, but I might be replaced by AI, uh, which is very real possibility. Anyone here not actually in AI? Anyone still trying to do an e-commerce startup, for example, or a social media startup? If you are, I, I, I'm very sorry for you. Don't bother. Uh, but we've had great presentations from Sudira and Lewis, and we're going to have a chat now. Uh, Technology has been able to do a lot of great things. It's been able to create uh, videos of cats playing guitar in Paris, which kind of bowled me over. Unfortunately, it doesn't allow us to teleport Sudira from California to Taipei, so we, uh, we have her on Zoom, which is almost as good. Uh, and we're going to start doing, uh, get into some real tough questions. Um, I apologize in advance, but that's just my style. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, first by sitting down and... Um, I want to ask Sidira the first question, and that's, uh, you, you showed a really interesting slide which can be broken down into three areas. One is the application layer, uh, one is kind of the model layer, and the bottom layer is the hardware layer. Right now, we can easily define that as the bottom layer is where you're making all the money. Um, you know, NVIDIA is, is making a lot of money. The middle layer is those who are burning all the money. 
but really in future, I think it's the application layer that has the, the greatest potential. So Sudira, tell us more about that and, and really for, forward five to 10 years, how important will be the foundation models versus the application layer, which is essentially what we're gonna be using as an interface for AI. Absolutely. Um, so this is the industry landscape in a nutshell that everybody is converging on. At the bottom layer, we have the hardware, like where this Cerebras is one of the startups that I see is built a, a, one of the largest um, you know, chips for AI. But there's a lot of consolidation in the bottom layer and it's very cost intensive. Uh, same with the infra and foundation model uh, layer. You see Google, Amazon, OpenAI play in this, uh, Azure Open uh, kind of play in this area. And it's going to see a lot of consolidation and maybe a, three to four players and uh, multiple other AI models, foundation models have come and inundated the market and that's going to go on for a while. Uh, that's, that's going to consolidate to less than 10 um, or so with three clear winners. Um, the, the other, the topmost layer is where I see in the last one year, there's been an explosion of investor activity an explosion of um, startups where if you have the training data, if you have the vertical expertise for that model, now is a fantastic time to be entrepreneurial and build that out uh, because uh, you have the foundation models layer. What I mentioned earlier used to take months in order to clean and create training data with prompting and with the right uh, data and with uh, you know a fine tuning layer on top of it uh, and with the right vertical use case. In the near future, there will be a clear tax AI winner. There may be a clear, um, you know, healthcare AI winner. So pick any vertical or and as as fine tuned as it can get. Uh, there will be, you know, a, a lot of great activity. And we'll give you a few examples of Mid Journey, Grammarly, uh, Workera, Runway. So all character AI. So just build characters out of AI within copywriting and marketing. We're seeing copy.ai and others. So there's a plenty of um, vertical AI winners that are yet to be created. But that's where there's a ton of opportunity for entrepreneurs as well as investors. Uh, Sudira, do you think there's any point getting into the foundational model level now? Is it too late? Uh, obviously, you know, a big organization you work with uh, is in that area. There's a, a few other companies out there. Do you think there's still room or do you think that really people should just move on beyond that and go really focus on the application layer because that's got the most potential? Um, so I feel like, um, and this is my personal opinion, um, so there is, this is a very cost intensive layer and there will be organizations that will continue to innovate on larger context windows or faster models. They'll work on the latency side of things and just these models will keep getting better and better. Uh, but with vertical AI, there can be a faster landing if you get the use case right and the vertical right, uh, because uh, I think that's where there's more opportunity versus I think the foundation models, the capital intensive side of things um, is, is, I think, a blocker for starting out right now at the bottom two layers because of the investment that has happened for many, many years with the data modes that uh, these large players have created. So I want to ask Lewis now, I mean, your company is quite interesting. Perfect Corp, if in case people don't uh, know this, was actually spun out of Cyberlink. So Perfect Corp is, is one of those examples of a company that, a little bit ahead of the curve, saw the potential of AI and, and really had to pivot. Um, and of course, the business model of, of Cyberlink has, has had to change a lot because we're not even, we're not burning CDs anymore, for example. So tell us about and the potentials for companies that are not in AI, but have a fundamental business model, and then have had to pivot. How was it that you guys, you know, nine, almost 10 years ago, realized that you had to pivot away from what you were doing, and you had to move into something else? And I, I wanna say stumbled, that's probably a bit unfair, but you realized that AI was, was really the way forward for you guys. Talk to us about that transition. Yeah, to be, to be fair, I mean, nine years ago, we didn't start as an AI startup, right? Nobody really dared to use AI as a, it was a scary word, especially for beauty and fashion. So when we started, what the mission was, how we create better accuracy in the solution, you know, better quality. Uh, we realized that the existing technology, there is a lot of uh, uh, bottlenecks. Right, so something that the research has been working for more than a decade. There's always the bottleneck in pattern recognition, in, in object tracking. And I think AI really was a, a, one, one of the trials that, okay, would this work? 
And unfortunately, you know, the data, the quality of the data, the tagging was getting good enough. So when we put it to test, we were really amazed. I mean, our client was amazed. They said, okay, how did you get that? So many companies tried to do that for many years, and they all fail. And really, that gave us a lot of confidence, say, this is the right way to go. I remember back then, we only have a very few engineers that knew how to code an AI. And we have to form very quickly a task force and having really kind of the seed trainer, the senior, want to learn about all these tools. And then they started training the other developers, right? So over the, the year, then we have more than a half of the developers today that are coding in AI. So I think it was a journey. It didn't start with a brilliant idea in day one. It's rather than a trial and learn, and then we start seeing it. Of course, we have seen other companies, let's say Tesla, for example, right? How they're using autonomous car with camera, tracking in life, uh, you know, buses and pedestrian and car. So we sort of that same idea, but instead of tracking these objects, you track the movement of your face, right? To track the movement of your eye, your lip. And then with that, we apply different effects for AR, for rendering makeups. So it was kind of a journey. You, uh, as you pointed out, you didn't start in AI, but now, of course, generative AI is a big thing, and anybody can create a, a, you know, a, a video of a cat playing guitar in Paris. You showed some examples that were a bit spooky as well. Do you think that you, uh, having come from Cyberlink and being spun out of Cyberlink, which already had video and, and, uh, and photographic background, was somewhat of a, a competitive advantage uh, compared to those who really had no other background of getting straight into it? Do you think that's the thing that has allowed you guys to stay alive and iterate instead of have to jump straight into something very advanced? I think so. I think it, it does give us uh, some advantage uh, you know, to start with because we have been working in multimedia, right? so a lot of IP around photo and video. So when we look at the AI, there's so much else AI can do today, right? So you talk about the question about going to build a foundation model or applications, we really see that there's huge opportunities out there. And many of our clients and brands company, they are either setting up AI committees or AI task force. Every company out there is trying to figure out what to do with AI. So I think you know, for startup in the room here or for ourselves, I think the opportunity might be to find something that is unique to you that you have some you know, knowledge about it. In our case, it's multimedia, it's photo and video. How we help consumer, right? You know, Microsoft like to talk about Copilot. How you help consumer make better photo editing and video editing you know, with assistant of the AI, something that I can be doing, you know, what uh, Sandita should show in minutes instead of spending hours. But if you're not already, you know, have the benefit of, of coming from a company like a Google or a Cyberlink, what advice can you give to people out there who want to get into AI, whether you're an investor, um, and you're looking out there for, for things. We've seen some demos here today, or you're just fresh out of college and you're looking for ideas, you know, AI is the future, but you're not quite sure where. So what would you suggest people look at? I think the potential is enormous. I mean, we're running a lot of innovation tasks, right? Because things that the traditional wisdom that you think that is too hard, you know, it cannot be solved. I think give it a try. I mean, the, the models that are out there, you know, created by all these tech giants and is ever evolving. Every two months, there's something new out there that is going to change your mind. So in the past, we may have been developing something and stuck in there for two years and you kind of get into the idea that this is unsolvable. I think now is the time to revisit those ideas and say maybe now with the AI power is really the timing. You know, maybe the timing was too early you know, uh, when we did it. Uh, so to, to me, I think the recommendation is really be open-minded, right? Because the opportunity is really big there. Um, there's a lot of technology created not only by the big company, but even you know, the, uh, in the startup community. In our, in our team, in our company, we spend a lot of time researching those, right? You know, going to conferences, listening to other startups, um, you know, testing new models, and then finding opportunities. Uh, Sudira, I want to ask you the same question. Uh, you know, where should people be like looking to use AI today? If you're in, in any kind of job, there's so many uh, possibilities out there. What do you suggest people who aren't even in AI right now should be doing given all the potential and opportunity and tools? Um, so as, as, um, as I mentioned earlier, there is a ton of potential for generative AI across multiple uh, verticals, multiple areas. So here are some practical applications. Um, so the potential of generative AI is great with enhancing creative processes. This is a bit of a surprise where we thought that, you know, some of the jobs that would be the hardest to do in terms of cognitive load, those are the ones that are getting enhanced with generative AI. Uh, personalizing user experiences, generating realistic content, improving decision making. These are the categories. And I've, um, in, in terms of the clean opportunities, we see uh, great opportunities with content creation, copywriting, marketing is getting transformed even within 
white collar jobs, you see a lot of content creation that let's say product management has to do or technical themes with documentation uh, generation. Uh, so these are all great uh, great generative AI opportunities. Personalized AI assistance. Um, so we see a lot of chat assistance across multiple verticals, whether you're doing a shopping cart assistance, whether you're doing, um, you know, just planning assistance or personal assistance in like travel advisory. So you see a lot of assistance uh, and use cases there. Automating repetitive tasks. This has been around for quite some time um, and, um, and data entry and reporting. I feel like this has been a supervised AI uh, application for the longest time. And we've seen a lot of customers as part of Google Cloud. I've seen a lot of customers automating and transforming their back offices with uh, supervised machine learning AI. And that's only getting much, much faster with generative AI. Uh, and then the future applications, um, there's a lot of potential to revolutionize industries like entertainment and movie making with video generation, manufacturing and beyond. Um, so text, for instance, this poem that I wrote, uh, <laughs> my only prompt was write a poem on Spark Labs Taiwan and then boom in a second. So all of these are creative tasks that are getting um, done within a matter of seconds. So um, this is a framework that I've uh, built in order to look at the Gen AI landscape and the various applications that fall in the generative AI bucket. Um, I can dive into that now, or unless you know we can uh, maybe tackle another question or two. Well, this is, this is the follow-up question to that, I think, is a lot of people are also asking, um, you know, what what are the roles or jobs that can't be replaced by by AI. I'm hoping your answer will be journalists and VCs, but we'll see. Um, but obviously there's a lot of automation tasks that can, can easily be replaced by AI and already have, but where are the areas that you don't see AI replacing in the next, say, 10 to 15 years? So I think this, this slide can be a good framework and I've built this and I've been validating this for the last, uh, for the last year as I was looking, I'm an investor myself. So as I looked at the market, um, so I'd like to guide your attention to the first quadrant here, which is, um, let's say, the x-axis is cognitive load. That is the difficulty of doing a task, the amount of brain power it needs in order to do this, uh, do any task. And the y-axis is high stakes or low stakes. Um, so in, in traditional AI, we've seen mostly back office automation, customer care, any airline that you call right now, it's more likely than not, you will talk to an AI assistant first and conversational AI assistant, and then you'll move on to you know, the, a, a real human being with content moderation on social media. And uh, there's a lot of AI applications. So traditional AI, so that is getting replaced and a lot of humans are getting replaced with AI in, the, in this quadrant one. In quadrant two, um, well, you will see a lot of investment opportunities uh, for photo editing, for social media content, but then these can be fads. You will see a big spike in usage and then a drop uh, because the cognitive load, these are essentially, um, uh, the cognitive load is not that high and the stakes, by that stakes, I mean the willingness to pay. Customers are not really going to pay for this, uh, the, the applications that are going to get built in the second quadrant. So it's it's low stakes and then it doesn't require too much of effort. Um, uh, you don't need a highly skilled labor to build AI in the second quadrant. Now, this third quadrant and fourth quadrant are where it, things get very interesting. This is where with the third quadrant, if you want returns in the next zero to five years, the foundation model game and tools and uh, a lot of technology is already in place. So if you pick verticals in these sectors like content creation, media movies, ed tech, task assistance, business comms, productivity tools, uh, SMB tooling, gaming and marketing. There is, a, the tech is there for you to really make an impact in that industry. And there is more willingness to pay. Um, and it's, it's going to see some near term returns if you get the uh, vertical AI use case right. And to your final question around where we think AI will come in last in order to replace, well, this is where there is a lot of willingness to pay. This is a lot of dollars go into this bucket. And within, we'll see more breakthroughs come and it will take five plus years for fully automated AI. Currently, there will be assistive AI or co-pilots in this area where you will see coding assistance but a full software engineer who is 
like automated with AI, that's going to take a few years. Right now, I'd say we are at 30%. Similarly, within defense and within search and discovery, within drug discovery. So these are some of the areas where there's very, very high cognitive load. It's very, it's a very skilled area and AI is becoming an assistant in this. And we're not going to see, let's say, surgeries and surgeons um, uh, kind of being automated using uh, AI. But it's, it's going to be a kind of high stakes. There's a lot of dollars if we're able to even provide an assistant in this area. So that's a great area to invest in for the long term. Uh, thank you, Sidra. I want to ask Lewis the same question. Obviously, you're in a in business that really is replacing humans in many, many ways. Um, you've probably, you know, you and Perfect Core probably put quite a, a few thousand humans out of jobs. What jobs are safe in the next five years? I think my view is, uh, you know, it's not the AI replacing the human. It's, you know, the human who knows how to use the AI replacing the human that who doesn't know how to use the AI. Uh, you know, and sometimes it's just crazy and I mean, collectively as a human, we make so many errors and I'm sure what I'm saying here probably will be wrong in two years. If you ask me two years ago or most of the people two years ago that question, I think our traditional wisdom that, okay, they will be first replacing the blue colors and then the white colors and then the creative guys. Guess what? It's completely the opposite. The first guy got replaced were the creative guys, with the music composer, with the painters, right? And now you get into the office space that we're talking about the white color, right? So it's not the journalist, it's now, you know, maybe, you know, the other jobs. And so if you ask me that question, I think the physical world still is a very demanding challenge, right? And again, I'm not asking robotics, but I feel that that potentially will be, you know, one of the last, you know, barrier for uh, humans to secure and hold to our, our assistance. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to know there are going to be some jobs uh, surviving after the AI revolution comes. Uh, please join me in thanking Sudira and Lewis for joining us today.